Hi, everybody. Welcome back to One Madison. We're here at IBM's beautiful headquarters in downtown Manhattan, Midtown. Glenn Finch is here. He's a global managing partner for Gen AI and Data. Glenn, good to see you again. Hey, Dave. Good to see you as always. So let's get into it. We're going to talk about all this agentic wave. We're going to talk about customer operations. Why? Let me start with why uh, are things like contact centers and customer operations, why is that such a starting point for a lot of organizations? Well, so when, you know, for the last few decades, we've been doing machine learning. Mm -hmm. And machine learning is awesome with numbers, right? And then we went to NLP, natural language, and that's what a lot of the previous things were built on. Then we came out with artificial intelligence that started to speak and listen. But generative I takes it to a whole new level, right? And when you think about it, its ability to speak, understand, understand inflection, things like that, it makes it ripe with all the conversational spots in customer contact, in customer service, in field service that we might need to do. Okay, so we went through the period of POCs. Right. We spun up a bunch of rag-based chatbots. It was like, oh, hey, it works, right. cool. Right. Vectorize the data and, yeah. okay, now what? And that's where, where, where you're saying we are today. Right. So when we've got, you know, single agent systems, uh, uh, co-pilots, if, if you will. We see Mark Benioff making fun of Satya Nadella right. and Clippy and all that so, stuff. Okay, right. yeah. so that's, that's fun. But if I'm a client, I'm like, okay, I really want to get down and dirty with this. I want to transform my business. Right. So where does, where are we with agents in Agentic? Because it starts with a data problem. Mm -hmm. uh, take us through maybe how you guys are helping customers get to that transformative stage. So I'm going to answer a question you didn't ask me first, just to kind of warm. Help me out, yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you, Glenn. So um, the, the interesting part about what happened somewhere in the fourth quarter, maybe third quarter, we started, you used the word rag. That's what hooked me. And, and yeah. anyway, we we all, we always use rag patterns all year, and then all of a sudden, the fourth quarter, IBM and others start saying, ah, "You don't need a rag pattern. You can use a teacher model." Right. So we launch Instruct Lab, right, which trains a model without a rag pattern. You just ingest some documents, mm -hmm. and it goes out and finds a million of occurrences. It'll help with that. That was around last May, I yeah, think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it started getting popular in the you know third and fourth quarter. But yeah, yeah. but that was the whole foundation of the whole deep seek thing. Remember that thing that shattered the market for a while? They it was the same principle. It was they, interesting. They used the teacher model, right? Sorry to interrupt, yeah. but I, when I saw deep seek, I'm like, oh, that's like granite. The reason I mention this to tie to your agent thing. For an agent to be successful, the, the concept of an agent is I'm going to orchestrate multiple models or long running processes so I can drive value, right? That, that's the whole concept of an agent, right? And so you have agents that supervise models and then you have agents that supervise agents, right? The bottom line is if, as you embed an agent into a business process, the model needs context. So, if, let's say it used to take me three weeks to drive the context of a business process into a model. I can now do that same thing with that teacher model concept with Instruct Lab in three days. Mm -hmm. So I have the ability to enable now models and agents with context in a very short period of time. So that we would, you know, where last year we'd be looking at multiple months to deploy agents we're now seeing agents deployed in like a couple weeks, right? And it, it radically transforms how you approach a problem when you can ingest policies, procedures, flow charts, whatever, from a client into a model in a, without using rag patterns and then start creating agents from there. It's a radical different paradigm. How does that data, whether it's a, a, a transaction system or an analytic system, you know, whatever system it is, how do I harmonize that data to give it confidence so that the agents can act with, with confidence uh, uh, on, on that data? Right, so there's, there's two pieces of data we need to get our arms around. Mm -hmm. 
the contextual data that I was just talking about, that's generally stuff that's slowly changing over time, right? That's easier to get your arms around. It's usually uh, mostly contained in unstructured format, although now as we advance more, we're starting to use more structured data to provide con context, right? The, the transaction data, that's the, that's the, you know, the million dollar question of wh what do I do? If, if I need to get an, uh, a model or an agent to start looking at that, how do I do that without moving all of the data into the model, right? So there's a whole bunch of techniques with data virtualization that are getting better and better and better over time. Something right? that IBM announced years right, ago, right? Right, right. I mean, right. But that was, that was so we could do it analytically, right? right? Um, and, and sometimes the service levels for analytics are different. I mean, I, I don't care if it comes tomorrow, but if you're thinking about the concept of an agent, I need that data there near real time. Yeah, before I lose to, the customer. Right, right, because I've got somebody on the phone, yeah. right? So how we do that um, depends on the scale of the enterprise, quite honestly. Mm -hmm. um, up to a certain point, all the virtualization in the world works awesome. Until you have 100 million customers, then it's hard to, then you have to take smaller context windows and then that's when you start to see a little bit more hallucination from the model, so it's a, it's not an easy consulting answer to tell you exactly how we do that, but we are using more virtualization techniques, more um, you know, more proxy techniques, things like that, to get the model, both the context it needs and the data it needs to do its job. What is the conversation like, Glenn, with your clients, and what is IBM's vision around the relationship between the humans and, and the agents? What does that look like? I don't know if you remember, Ginny declared that we had an AI treatise, this is our AI principles. But there's a whole bunch of things where we always have human in the loop, right? Whether it's a back office process, a front office process, those types of things, right? Um, so clients are, um, they are moving more and more towards being willing to let more things happen in a highly automated fashion because what they find is that um, there's such high turnover rates in the contact centers that, that if, if all they do is just help stem some of the issue with turnover, I mean, some of these contact centers have 50% turnover. Massive learning curve, it's hard to sit, all, the, all those kinds of things, right? So a lot of clients are saying, okay, for the excess or for the whatever, we're going to let, a, not a chatbot, but a, a digital virtual agent mm -hmm. that can have a generative conversation with you, we'll let them you know, take calls. And you know, what, what strange part is what we're finding is that the net promoter score, the client perceived value of those channels is actually higher than the call center. Because uh. I don't have to wait, and there's a high likelihood I'm going to get the same answer every time, right? And there's another thing um, I'd love to talk to you about, which is to even improve that, this whole concept of generative user experience. So whenever you want to go there, I'm happy to go there. So what I'm hearing is that the quality of your outcomes is so good that you can measure now yeah. through you know, customer sat. Yeah. Could you, maybe before we go there, could you give me an example of where this type of activity and AI is enhanced customer operations with, with, with BPO? You know, we have m multiple clients that rely on us to deliver BPO in the contact center and other spaces. And w w I, I want to make sure that, um, you know, in the BPO business, there's two types of contact centers. I, I've got a forward-facing customer contact center where, you know, what's my account balance, right? But then, whether it's HR, whether it's finance, whether it's procurement, there are oftentimes massive contact centers there because I want to know the status of my purchase order. I, I need to ask this question about this finance traction. Uh, um, I, I need to change my work location, right? And you know, we oftentimes find clients with 500,000, 2,000 person centers that are just answering the phones in the back office too, mm -hmm. right? So in in multiple examples through, through you know, HR, through finance, 
through all those back office places, you know, we're, we're seeing uh, both efficiency and efficacy driven, you know, 50, 60, 70 percent. So you, you see those efficacy and efficiency plays. And I'd love to tell you that immediately customer satisfaction goes up like through the roof. Sometimes it does. Other times, you know, like in our, in our own case, we, we kind of burnt the ships. We turned off all the phone numbers. That wasn't the best uh -oh. strategy, right? <laughs> uh, so so you, learning more, doing it to ourselves, um, we, we now know how to do that. I mean, burning the boats in certain use cases might not be the worst thing in the world. No, it's, it really is a forcing function, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is. It seems to me that Agenta can play a role there in terms of not only how we interact with a natural language, but also reforming workflows, um, taking the human reasoning traces when there's an exception right. and actually building that into a workflow. Are, right. are we there yet? Do you have examples of that that you can sort of point to to say that this is actually working in the way in which we envision Agentic? Yeah, so we've spent the last two years um, working with um, both our own software company and our partners on doing just that, on you know taking all of the business processes that are in Tony's business and creating agents and workflows in, in orchestration tools, right? Um, whether they're uh, IBM's Orchestrate, whether they're uh, Power Automate, whether they're Copilot, wh whatever, what, they come under different names, right? Fundamentally, again, you have to teach those tools context and then you help them learn the process and, and they are pretty good at reasoning there's still some things that they can't do, right? And then you'd, you'd flip out to the human. The, the new place where we're seeing agents roll out, and I'm going to switch to that gen UI thing for a minute, Please. right? Um, we have a client that, um, that has a, a voracious web and mobile experience. But there is about 15 million times in a year that a client goes to the web and mobile and they don't get what they want. So they pick up the phone. So what we did is we used Gen AI to reverse engineer all those 15 million phone calls and build a generative user experience at the web and mobile. So that when Dave calls, your web and mobile experience is gonna look dramatically different than when Glenn calls. Because I'm gonna base it on what I know about you and, and what you're likely calling about. And then when that experience shows up and, and, and I prompt you with, hey, are you calling about these three or four things? Or do you, do you have another question? What, what's crazy, it's the same experience you're used to on Amazon when, you know, hey, hey do you want this thing? You want that thing, right? You know, to do that, Generative UI customer facing you need a traditional machine learning engine to pick what to talk to Dave about, and then you need to hand that over to generative AI to create this generative user experience that's very rich, that's very contextual. Not, hey, um, Dave, your answer to your question is on page 22 of the 73-page PDF. Read it. No, I'm, I'm going to answer your question, and then I'm going to provide you with two or three things that you should have asked me about, but didn't, right? That, that whole thing is just wicked cool, right? If, if you can take and offload those, you know, more detailed, heavy detail calls that came from, you know, a, a web and mobile experience that wasn't what it needed to be. So you use agents in the back to drive, you know, cycle time, you use agents in the front to drive intimacy in a way that we never could before. I like how you describe that. You, you've got, we use these terrible names like legacy AI right. or non-Gen AI, Gen AI, yeah. AI. but you, you basically described a very complimentary, you know, hardcore math and, yeah. and science on top of that is democratizes that user experience um, and, and, and enables just in a completely new interaction. Yeah, it's awesome. It is awesome. Last question. Help me with the business case. Right. Give me the big two or three around you know, customer service that, that we should be focused on to develop the business case, to take to management. Where's the value? It all depends on how invasive you're willing to be with the 
end customer communications, right? The simplest thing is I've got an agent, a call center agent sitting there. I'm going to do call summary. I'm going to do research. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to augment that and I'm going to cut half of average handle time. Something simple like that, right? Okay. So what if I want to be more aggressive? Right. So th then, then I look at um, the places, but most likely you're going to have an IVR. You look at the places where people bypass the IVR and make a phone call, right? Again, you use generative AI to listen to the phone calls and, and basically create its own digital virtual agent. And then you enable that agent to go to the same place, usually level one is simple questions, and then level three is, I got to go look at page 22 of the 73 page PDF to get Dave's specific answer, right? You follow what a human would do, only you let Gen AI tell you how to do that, right? And, and that's where, you know, pretty comfortably, um, you can take about half of all those calls and, and answer them or enable them to be answered with, with generative AI. And I'm not playing whack-a-mole with turnover. Right. The, the humans that are there are actually uh, interacting with the agents in a way that's, they are. that's, uh, that's enriching right. um, and fulfilling. Yeah, you know? and you know, the first, we, we like starting at the desktop mm -hmm. because it makes the agents feel better. So actually, when you deliver a lot of those things, call summaries, research, all those things, you usually sure see turnover decrease, right? Because it's not as hard, right? Um, and then, and then when the you know when the agent starts to be involved in answering more complex questions, then you see turnover decrease again because they feel better. They're not answering what's my balance four hundred times in a day, right? That kind of thing. And I'm laughing because the you know the call summary you listen to somebody type. Hold on, yeah, you know yeah. You, you can't go yet. That's no, right. but I want to go. I've been on the phone <laughs> for a yeah, half yeah, hour. You got, right? you got to wait for me. Yeah, <laughs> Clint, thanks so much. I really appreciate yeah. your awesome. insights and a great conversation. Really yeah, appreciate same day. Thanks. All right, keep it right there for more action from One Madison at IBM. I'm Dave Vellante. We'll be right back. Mm -hmm.